Okay, good, good morning. So as you heard, uh, Rich will be back from his travels next week, and uh, so he's on the last of the series of guest speakers here. Uh, I, I guess they call it clean up, right? That's the sports thing. Um, I'm, I'm not really good at sports, so I don't know. Maybe I'm using the wrong term, but I'll, I'll stop now. Um, so I'm always amazed how things happen. Uh, you know, the interaction of everything, as some I talked about before. And so we, back maybe a month ago or so, Richard asked me if I, I could do this, and so, so I said, sure. So I'm thinking about what topic should I talk about. And I'm thinking, and I said, well, you know what? Why don't I continue where I left off in July? I had done a session in, in July when, when Rich was traveling. And um, I had that, that privilege. And um, I talked about God's method and how things act and events happen and things happen. And then, and then God uses it all for good. So we'll revisit little pieces of that today. But... And I thought, let's continue, and what would be a good segue is if I talk about God's timing and how the, God's time might be a little different than ours. And the, sure enough, amazingly, Justin gets up here two weeks ago, and he's talking about using time wisely and don't waste time, and you, know, you should use your time for you know, God's will. And then Jim gets up the week after, and he's talking about uh, God's timeless and the passage of time. And I'm saying to myself, are these guys reading my notes? I, uh, so I'm just always in awe of how this kind of stuff interacts. But what was really cool about the whole thing is, is they were talking about the same theme that I was going to talk about, but the message was totally different. So it wasn't like they were stealing my stuff, okay? So... So, but I'm always shocked with that stuff, how it, it just all interplays, everything just interacts, and, and how things happen like that. And you would think that they were reading my notes, but, but it's, it's different. So back in July, I talked about how God does all things for good, as that cause and e effect. And everything interacts, and, and one thing feeds into something else, and then there's all these things we don't even know about. We don't even know that they're happening. One, one event happens, good or bad, and, and some other things happen. We might know about those, we might not, but they all come out for some common good. So, and I use that word causation, which is, it means exactly that. So even the worst stuff can be for the better of something else, whether we know it or we don't know it. So I put up this slide here, and this was one of the passages. And it, and it says, if you wanted to turn or just read the slide, Romans 8.28, uh, it's just a little tiny passage. And it says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And we have been called according to his purpose. Now what... What's interesting about this passage is there is superlatives, okay? And the superlatives are, we know. And, and that, if you look at that, there's no doubt in we know. All right? It's not we think or we kind of feel this way or it's a kind of sort of maybe. We know. There's no question. There's no doubt. It's a, it's a firm statement. We know it without question. And what's more of a superlative is it's all things. It's not most things, some things, many things, quite a few. All is one of those exclusive terms that means no exception. All is all. All is everything and anything with no exception whatsoever. So sometimes it might be hard to believe this when you'd say, okay, how can all things be good? And, and we've heard this, right? And sometimes we have those doubts, right? And we ask, you know, God, if you love me, how can you let something bad happen to me? Why would this happen? 
And even when the strangers ask those questions too, right? And, and that's a hard question when a stranger says to you, well, if God's so loving, why do people hurt? And, I, you know, I put a lot of thought into that kind of stuff. And, and, and you realize that, you know, through that hurt, it, there's really what comes out of it is, is you know, if, I'm trying to explain it better, but uh, the hurt brings you to a point where you, where you are then lifted up. And without the hurt, You'd never, have, you'd never have that feeling of being lifted up. It would just always be the same thing. You're just always the same. You know, it's kind of like, I think of it like, when you live in Florida, it's summertime all the time. It's not that exciting, right? It's just always summertime. And, and I have to believe that if you, if you just always had great everything, that just becomes the normal. There's no uplifting. There's no seeking God because you're just always at this, what you think is a high level. So I have to believe that those peaks and valleys, that's, that stuff is what opens us up. That's, <clears throat> that's what makes us want to hear and accept and, and, and pull towards God. So that in itself is where her and the, the thing, the troubles becomes something good. What also is interesting with this passage is, if you notice, the people part is very limited. You know, the God part is unlimited, right? It's all things. And we know without question. There's no doubt about it. But if you look at the people part, the people part is limited. <clears throat> it says, those who love him, not everybody, it doesn't say all people, it says those, those who love him, those who accept, those who pull towards God. It's limited. Those who have been called, okay? Those who seek the Lord. So you see, it takes, it takes faith. It's a two-way street. It takes faith to get to the point where all things are good. And, and, and that's the part that, you know, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of, People, not necessarily here, but people in general, they, they miss those points. They never, their eyes are never open to that. So, these events open doors. Even the small ones will open a door and, and give us an opportunity to be lifted up. And more forcefully, tragedy brings change. Right? Big tragedies bring big, bring big changes. And all you have to think about is, is September 11, 2001. The massive tragedy brought massive changes. That was a world changer. Okay? It changed security. It changed how people think of things. It changed the Middle East. It changed a lot of things. That's the events that, again, opened doors to change. But it's also a way God speaks to us. You know, it, these events that open the door or make us listen or, or have us change our mind. I mean, no, that's God talking to us. Not necessarily in words, but in, in actions or events or things that are eye openers. That's what God does. But we don't like change, right? No, nobody likes to change things. It's not comfortable, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of trouble, it's a lot of unknowns. And then sometimes it doesn't, what you change doesn't always work that well and you gotta keep changing it, so you're changing the change. Um, but eventually it all sinks in. It all sinks in and even the unreachable folks, even the people who just cannot accept the Lord will will start to turn. They think, they, all of a sudden, it's, it's, a, it's a wake up call. So even the unreachable can be reached through actions and events. And the other, of course, is things happen for a reason. And reason isn't random. Reason is reason. 
It, it's not chance. as a purpose. And again, it's something that helps us draw near to God. So if we know that all things are for good, why is there such a valley when something bad happens? And, and by valley, I mean there's a time space between the bad and something better. But it's also, you know, I use the word tragic and all that, but bad things can also be minor. A flat tire, cut finger. It, it all works. It doesn't have to be grand and, and, and tragic. And then there's good for good. Right? You pay it forward. You, something good happens and it gives an opportunity to do something else, to serve or help someone. Or, so there's good for good. But what happens a lot of times with that? Way too often, right, what, do we, what happens? We're too busy. It come, the opportunities come and we don't really think we're ready. We don't feel like it. It's just not the right time. Maybe later on that would be okay, but right now it's not really a good time. So we get the tragedies that are eye-opening. We get the good things that help us do things and, and help for an overall better good, help us draw closer to God. But there's all these barriers, right? Our own stubbornness, the timing, all these things that happen. And then sometimes we don't even see the blessings because they happen somewhere else or they happen without us knowing it. You know, we don't see them at all. But because we don't see it doesn't mean it didn't happen, right? I mean, we can't see air. That's around. We can't see bacteria, right? We know that's around. So, but sometimes we get to think, oh, you know, this town, what could come good out of my flat tire? Well, you don't know. You don't know. And I've, I've told that story before, right? We, you could have a flat tire, and then you didn't hit the small child that ran into the road at the time you normally drive by that, 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 that street. So we never know. We just have to have faith. We have to understand or, or believe that there is a bigger purpose. So, one of the other barriers besides the timing and we're too busy and all this other stuff is a lot of times we fight these things, right? We resist, you know, we have other things going on, you've got other plans, we, we don't want to go this way because we've already decided we're going that way, and, and we, we resist it and we fight it. And that's another barrier to why we don't always see the, the good outcome. Or there's this big gap between these things happening. So what we have to do, we've got to stop fighting. We've got to stop and rely on this, this is God's plan, not my plan. This, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the moment. I'm not going to fight the moment. It takes a lot of faith to be patient like that, too. A lot of faith. And we're not patient people, right? We hate slow drivers. We get furious when people take our parking spot, right? How many times you're pulling in and you're going to park, and then somebody zips in in front of you, right? Oh, it's a day racker, right? <laughs> so, so we fight. We can't be patient. It's just not our nature. We don't even like being ignored. I'm talking to you. Pay attention. All right. Why are you looking away? Why are you looking at your phone? Uh, all right. We don't. We don't even want to be ignored. Everything sets us off. So it takes tons and tons and tons of faith to have that patience, to to just believe that there's going to be a good outcome from whatever it is. Good for more good. Or, slight bad things or tragedies. And, and we have to accept that sometimes we won't know about it. We're just not going to 
We're just not going to see it. We just have to accept that. So, here's a little piece of history that I think shows us some stuff here. It takes a lot of faith to accept the unexplained. Calvin Coolidge, right, who's not a well-known president, but he's actually, if you study him, was, was really, really quite, quite a guy. So he's our 30th president. He served in the early 1920s. His son died of blood poisoning while he was in the White House. And what's more ironic is his son died because he got a blister on his foot when he was playing tennis, and the blister got infected. And in the 1920s, that just didn't, didn't you know, we didn't have all the, 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 the shots and pills we have today. That, that was it. it, it killed him. So Calvin Coolidge blames a lot of things, but he doesn't blame the Lord. And, and here's a quote, and, and the other thing to remember is Calvin Coolidge is a very quiet guy. He had a nickname, Quiet Cal. Didn't say a whole lot. So for him to say this kind of stuff was, was big. So Kevin Coolidge says, if I had not been president, he, this is his son, would not have raised a blister on his toe, which resulted in blood poisoning, playing tennis on the South Lawn. In his suffering, he was asking me to make him well. See? See, my dad's the president. Why can't he fix me? And Coolidge says, I, I could not. And when he went, the power and the glory of the presidency went with him. In other words, that's a humble statement. He, he said, I didn't care about being president. That was all out the window. You know, my son died in the White House. And he said, the ways of providence are often beyond our understanding. And by providence, he means the Lord and, and the Lord's plan, the direction. All right? Divine providence is often referred to as God's plan. So Kevin Kula says, the ways of providence are often beyond our understanding. It seems to me that the world had need of the work that was probable that he could do, that his son could do. I do not know why such a price was expected for the occupancy of the White House. So to me, you know, I read that and I say, you know, wow, he's not saying, you know, God, you were me. He just said, in his mind, I sacrificed my son and, and here I am. I supposedly this great thing of being president, but it was a nothing. That was a nothing compared to the loss of my son, and I can't understand God's plan. I just know that it is. So another famous quote is, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. So that was a, a Martin Luther King quote. And to me, when I read that, it says exactly what I've been saying. It takes faith to be patient. It takes faith to accept that unexplained. I have another slide. I can operate this thing. So, if you want to turn to E class, E, let me find you spit it out. E class, I'm going to say it wrong. E class, E class, <laughs> anyway, 11.5. All right, well, you can again read it up on the screen there. But both these, you know, great leaders were saying we must accept this disappointment and not lose the ultimate hope. So in this passage, it says, God, you know, the Lord basically showing us, as you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. So again, almost exactly what Coolidge said, right? You cannot understand the work of God. 
So we don't know why these things happen, you know, and why those who should live pass and those who should pass live. Another piece of history. Andrew Jackson, another president. An assassin came up to him and shot at him twice, and twice the gun didn't go off. So the story is this, 1835, January 30th, which is next week and a half or so, Andrew Jackson is leaving the Capitol building. He's 67 years old, he's got a cane, not in super great health. An assassin runs up to him at close range and, and pulls out a gun and fires. The gun doesn't go off. Jackson, being the tough guy that he was, takes his cane and starts hitting the assassin. He's whacking the assassin with his cane. Because there wasn't secret service back then or anything. He was pretty vulnerable. Okay? So while Jackson's clubbing the assassin, he, the assassin pulls out a second gun and shoots at Jackson, like two feet away. The gun misfires, you know, those old flint pistols, it, it fizzles, the gun doesn't go off. Now, Jackson should have passed away. He should have been shot at least once, if not twice. So why do these things happen? Right? But here's Jack, that's nothing new for Jackson. I don't know if you know, Jackson served in the Revolutionary War, as a very young man, a young child actually, and he also served in the War of 1812, both fighting the British. So during the revolution, he's captured by the British. And he's only like 14 at the time. And they weren't very nice to him. They, their POWs, they were, weren't feeding them. They were very, very um, uh, mal, malnutrished. Nu, 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 and ironically, this guy's name, the British, the British major, known as Major Coffin, okay, demands that Jackson clean and polish his boots. So Gus Jackson, being how he was, said, no, I'm not doing that. So you imagine, you get a 14-year-old boy standing up to this British major who had a sword and the whole bit. So what's the British major do? He swipes at Jackson with his sword, cuts his hand, cuts his face, he's all scarred up. So right then, Jackson, I mean, he could have been killed. And back then, it could have got infected very easily. Then in the War of 1812, you know, 40 years later, Jackson is defending New, New, New Orleans. He's got a little group of volunteers. They're not trained. They're just all different country people pulling together. Here comes the well-trained, regulated British Navy and they do a landing in New Orleans. Jackson's outnumbered almost two to one, and they handedly push back the British, who ultimately leave the port. So again, Jackson could have been killed. Remember, this is the day the, the leader didn't sit in the back. The leader was up on a horse with the cutlass and yelling charge and taking fire and bullets are whizzing by. So Jackson could have been killed many, many times, but he wasn't. And then, Poor Calvin Coolidge's son dies of a, a blister on his toe. So we don't know always why these things happen the way they happen. But that's, that's part of God's timing. So we, we just know it's, it's biblical, right? God tells us. But think about this. The Coolidge tragedy is still having an impact. We're still talking about it right here today. Right? We're using it as an example. A hundred years later, it's still making us think a little bit. Okay? Now, of course, in God's time, a hundred years isn't a long time. That's that gap I was talking about. For God, a hundred years is, is very little. So God reveals things to us through these events. And the impact varies depending on the timing, right? Something that could be a, a tragedy at one time might not be such a tragedy later on. For example, if a small child loses a parent, that's tragic. That's very, very tragic. 
But if that same child now grows and they're elderly themselves, they almost expect at some point they are going to lose that parent. They're, they're, they're mentally expecting it to happen. All, only difference there is some time. It's the same parents, the same child. The only difference is some time, but it goes from devastating to, well, I, I know. The other barrier of what helps us to understand all this is we only have one point of per perception, and that's us. We're the standard. All right, and the problem is us follows us everywhere we go. So even though we know the us isn't necessarily perfect, or we've got lots of flaws, we like to learn the hard way, so we trust in us anyway. We trust ourselves better than anything else. The problem is we only know what we know. Right? We don't know everything. And we need tons of faith because everything beyond what we know takes faith. We don't know it. We have to believe it. And to believe it, we need, we need that kind of faith to believe. So human nature is to use ourselves as the standard, right? The me is what knows best. And we know all about ourselves. And even more so, we, we think we need to share because we know so much about everything. We, we want to share it. And we want to say, well, this is what I would do. And, well, you know, you know what I think. And, you know, blah, 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 just saying. So... We, we want to share all these things that we think we know. And I'm not talking about good advice. That's, that's different. We, it's well thought out and it's, it's a, a objective and, and, and counseling. That, that's different. I'm talking about all the, those off the cuff, random everything. You know, the reactionary stuff. There's no reflection, right? There's no thought before speaking. It's just a reaction. Right? That's, the, that's the stuff that's harmful. So maybe the me part or the us part isn't such a good standard. But what we do need to embrace is that the timing of events brings us a new perspective. When something happens, good, bad, or otherwise, and when it happens, that gives us a new perspective. That's our opportunity to think a little differently or feel a little differently. That, that new perspective is the things that we don't have. So God's reaching out to us through all this. And then if we think about what happens in all that gap between events, you know, they ripple outwards. It's kind of like when you push your hand in the water and it, it starts to ripple out. And the longer you wait, the bigger the ripple. The wider the ripple, the more it reaches. So maybe the time gap thing is good, right? So we, we, we get impatient. We want, we want action now. When it's faster, better. So what we do is something happens, and we think there should be a result. There should be something. If, if this is all true, if all, this, all things are for good, then, then something should happen very quickly. But if you think about it, that time gap is what allows it to reach out further and reach more. That's the part that we, we lose when we're impatient and we don't give it a chance. But sometimes that time gap is really cruel, right? It's not, it's not fun. And then we hear things, you know, oh, it's on God's time and God's own you know, do cost. But except, even if we accept that, it doesn't make it easier. It just, you know, helps explain. But it's really part of God's plan anyway. Even if it's not fun, it's, it's something that fits the bigger picture, the parts that beyond us. So, the other thing to remember is God's time is a little different than our time. 
God isn't being cruel with the, the gap and the seen and unseen stuff. Because God's boundless, God's endless. And you heard Jim and Justin both said, right, in Psalms 90, which again, I had in my notes, these guys are talking about it. A thousand years in your sight are a day that has just gone by. In Second Peter, they talk about with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. So God's very soon isn't necessarily our very soon. We always think as soon as tomorrow or the day after, or maybe next week at the most. So God's soon could be a very long time. You know, if you think about what is 1% of e eternity? It's a lot of years. Mm -hmm. So God's on a different, he's in a different time zone than we are. And think about it, God's, the God of everything, right? The God is sometimes referred to as the God of the universe. So if God's the God of all things, wouldn't it be a little arrogant for us to think that God's time is exactly our time? I mean, think about it. An earth year is 365 and a quarter days, right? An earth day is 24 hours. So that's all about us. But if God's... God of everything, well, how about this? Venus's year is 225 days. So that little fireball zipping around the sun quicker than Earth is. But get this, Venus's day is 243 Earth days. It barely spins. It actually goes around the sun, a full revolution, and it's only three quarters of a day. So, which, if, if you do the math, that's 5,800 hours. Now, that's a long day, you know? If you, if you ever feel like you've had a long day here, go to Venus. <laughs> and then you get Jupiter, takes 12 Earth years to go around the sun, but it spins in 10 hours, all right? So you get two sunrises to one on Earth. A galactic year, our galaxy, the, 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 the Milky Way spins. It takes 225 million years to spin once. So a galactic year is 225 million Earth years. So how long is God's year? I don't know. I, I wouldn't speculate because I have no idea. But it very likely could be different than what we imagine it is. Right? We just don't know. But the Bible tells us not to try to figure it out not to try to know the, the time and hour and all these things. We just hurt ourselves trying to do that. Just, you just have to have faith. And we know God's timing's perfect. Our timing, not so much. I mean, how many times have you said something at the wrong time? Okay. God doesn't have that problem. But here's some challenges. Try to explain something in a timeless fashion. That, that's, that's something that God has to do. The Bible has, is timeless. It has to apply to thousands of years. So what happens? It requires symbolism and parables. And, and unfortunately, sometimes the skeptics say, oh, that's, those are fairy tales. Those are stories. Okay? So try this. Let's if I can turn this. <coughs> So try this. Try to explain what that is, and you can't use any words that didn't exist, or, or, yeah, that didn't exist 2,000 years ago. So it's 1 AD, and you've got to explain to somebody what that is. Okay? What are you going to do? It, I don't know, it's a big silver bird, it screams, smoke comes out of it. Okay, make screeching noises when it hits the ground. Uh, that's a real challenge. So how do you describe something to be timeless 
without using parables and symbolism. That's why the Bible's full of it. It, won't, it would never apply to thousands of years of people if it used today's words only. Okay? So what happens is you do, you do the parable. And you say, okay, it's a great silver bird that screeches across the sky at high speeds. And it makes screaming noises when it lands and all this. And the skeptics, you know what they see? That's what they see. And they go, oh, that's one of those fairy tales that, you know, that Bible, that's out of date. That's out of date. That can't apply anymore. So that's the challenge of trying to explain things to such a big audience and, and such a broad group. So here's another thing to think about. Do you want to live forever? Right? Now, we know salvation and that. But I'm saying right here on this planet, do you want to live forever? And, you know, talking about mortality and lifespan, that's a hard topic to really want to cover. But I, I don't know. I think about it maybe a little different than, than, than some folks. If you really think about living forever, right here in, in the earth, think about some of the challenges, okay? Could you be a good ambassador for the Lord for thousands of years? That takes a lot of energy and stamina. Could you keep the spark? You, you're constantly being barraged with culture changes and all these things. Could you keep the fresh ambition or would it just kind of fade over time? Think about this, living more, I know it sounds crazy, but the time span that we live is actually helpful and I'm gonna explain that. How much has changed since you were a child? You guys don't count, okay. okay. How much has changed since you were a child? Okay. How does it feel? Okay, and today if we look at, you know, people say, it's all the music today, oh, it's garbage. All oh, the clothes, I can't believe the clothes. And how about those piercings? Okay, the older you get, the less you can tolerate the change. Okay? Everybody wants to remember the good old days. Things were way better then. Okay, and think about it, that was, that was not a long time ago the good old days. What if the good old days were the time of the Vikings, okay? Or knights and squires, okay? How would, that, how would they relate with all the culture change now? Would it all just blend together? I bet it wouldn't. What would happen if a Viking's walking around with their battle axe and the cops see them, okay? Or Knight and Squire charging through Central Park, fetching my shield, and my lance. It's just not going to work. But that's the kind of stuff that might happen if we live forever. So maybe that limited time span on Earth is part of God's plan. Seems a little smarter than we might think. Way better than those, the massive culture shocks. Let's not go back to Vikings and squires. Let's just go, let's say the good old days were 250 years ago, right? Mid 1700s, the revolution, America's coming out of its own. The British are ruling, but things are heating up. But how would George Washington feel about society today? Okay? I'm going to guess heartbroken. So, would George Washington want to really be alive today? How about 150 years ago, right? That's around Abe Lincoln's time. Think about it. That seems like a long time ago. That's two 75 years lifespans back to back. That's not, that's not a long time. But it seems so radically different, the way they dressed and acted. And I 
And then the memories, right? How many people can name the first and last name of all your great grandparents? We'll say there's eight, minimum eight of them. Could you name the first and last name, maiden names? Almost no one can. Have no idea. What if you had your great, 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 great grandparents were alive and you had all this big culture thing that intertwined, these big giant families? How would Thanksgiving be with 500 people? Could we handle it? Could we handle that long range change? I'm even going to think of a thousand years. We can't handle 50 years of change. And how many people will say things like, well, the kids these days, they got no values. They got nothing. Now you guys, you guys are exceptional, okay? <laughs> but in general, walk through, walk through a city sometime, okay? Or some built up area. Now, none of this is new. I read some quotes. This is a quote. Never has youth been exposed to such dangers of perversion and arrest as in our own land and day, meaning right here in America. Increasing urban life with its temptations, lazy occupations, passive stimuli, I guess that's like Game Boy, right? Passive stimuli, just when an active life is needed most. Early freedoms for these children, lessening sense of duty and discipline, the haste to know and do before it's time, and the mad rush for sudden wealth, and the reckless fashions worn by youth, those clothes. They all lack the regularity that can be found in older cultures with more conservative conditions, okay? That was, that was written by Granville Hall as a warning about the dangers of the coming generation, written in 1904, okay? 1904, when people wore their Sunday best every week, okay, and put on the top hat, okay? He's worried about the reckless youth. So how would today feel, okay? Pants hanging down, chains come out of their ears, they'd freak out. Here's another quote. I think morals are getting much worse. There were no such girls in my time as there are now. When I was 20, my mother would have knocked me down if I had spoken improperly to her. Okay? This is Charlotte Kirkman speaking also about troubled youth in 1843. Okay? So this isn't new stuff. This has been going on forever. Can you imagine living 150, 200 years, 300 years? How would, you, how would these people feel? If they felt like this then, how would they feel now? Let's go back a little further. The morals of the children are tenfold worse than formerly. That's Lord Ashley in the UK talking to the House of Commons in the mid 1700s, okay? This is, none of this is new stuff, All right? So my point is, God's plan doesn't always seem all that, we'll say, rational. We can't understand it. We can't digest it. But we know it's good. We know, again, I go back to the, we know that all things are for good. And after hearing all this stuff, I mean, would you really want to spend eternity on a place like Earth? doesn't sound very attractive, okay? But again, God's plan is, let's not spend eternity on earth, let's spend it in heaven, okay? Let, 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 let's pray. Dear Lord, we don't always understand your timing. We don't always understand your plan. We don't always understand the, the delays and the differences and how your time isn't like our time. But we do know that when we ask for forgiveness, there's no delay at all. You forgive us when we ask. You're always faithful. You're always with us. We seek you and you draw close to us. We know these things and we know all things are for good. We pray that you'll give us the faith to, to hold on to that and to 
accept that and to know that your ways are the best ways and we don't know always what we do. Amen.